morning, guys, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, today is uh, for us a nice, interesting, uh, quite special day having a uh, uh, young Reichelt. Uh, uh, I practice his last name, by the way. <laughs> Uh, as a guest, he uh, is a uh, founder and uh, uh, um, inventor and former, former scientist as well. Uh, so he kind of relates in many ways to our community and uh, he has a little uh, uh, experience to tell us of a fantastic uh, startup and uh, uh, buyout uh, and exit and actually not really an exit, a continuation in a larger group, uh, which you all know, which is also here. Um, I welcome uh, the guys connected by uh, video conference, and uh, very shortly, shortly I will uh, pass the microphone to Jan, and uh, um, I suppose we will be taking questions uh, and uh, curiosity afterwards. So let me join me in uh, welcoming Jan Eichelt uh, and his experience. Thank you. So, uh, save that for later if you like, uh, depending on how well I do with the talk. Uh, so I, I have to put this, uh, you know, a little bit more relative. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider myself to be a very good scientist, I have to say. Uh, I mean, I, I did a business degree actually in university, and then I moved on to start a PhD in computer science. But I'm a crap researcher, I have to say that. I have no international publications. I did some medium good stuff for the German market, writing a computer science standard textbook together with my professor in Germany, but I wouldn't consider myself to be, a, let's say, a very excellent researcher. So, I, I, for example, I never would have had the chance to work at an institution in Germany that resembles IIT in, 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 in Italy. Uh, I was always more on the practical side, and I chose to do a PhD uh, because I was interested in a specific topic, information management and electronic business and because I wanted to use the time uh, during P the PhD to kind of explore, right, to find out things about what I like, maybe start a business, uh, have a good time basically. I have to, <laughs> have to admit that I, I, I have this very practical attitude. So, um, and once I was doing my PhD in this specific topic, we, we started as PhD students together with two friends we started to discover that we had a problem which are PDF documents, uh, research papers that were published by big publishers such as Elsevier uh, and written by scientists such as you. So, and then there were cases where six years ago I would be sitting there, right, not in Italy, in Germany, but I would be sitting there and listening to these talks. And so I was fascinated by those guys who just took an opportunity and said, okay, let's see what I can build. So it's more about this uh, building actually rather than necessarily researching. So we realized that we had these hundreds and thousands of PDF documents that we needed to read, right? You download that stuff and you need to read it and then you need to kind of make highlights and annotations, maybe sometimes they print it out and then suddenly like a week later you forgot, oh, what did I read last week in this PDF document? And then you have the citations and then how do you understand what is the next paper I need to read? And sometimes my colleagues would tell me what to read, sometimes my professors, sometimes I would find it out myself. But it's, it's really not good, it's not a good experience, it's very messy, it's, very, it's a big problem. So I started to talk about that and talk to everybody because suddenly this little side project, which was my interest, which did not have anything to do with my research, uh, which by the way is also the reason why I never finished my PhD, uh, became bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is the story of Mendeley where we stumbled upon an opportunity which we were so passionate about and we wanted to get out of this world, right? Because I feel it's not justified that this problem exists in the world where people fly to the moon. And we have problems organizing PDF documents. I mean, it's ridiculous. So, and that, that kind of grew in Mendeley and that's basically the story of what I'm going to tell you. So, just to tell you a little bit about the background, so you know, what is the product, what do we do, and, and how did we grow, how did this become much bigger than, than actually just a side project. So this, uh, this is uh, one of us back then, and you, you have all these PDF documents flying around, around your head, and you know, getting your head around is really difficult. So we developed software that runs on Mac, <laughs> Windows, and Linux, and we just released a new iPhone app, which gets raving reviews. Um, and you can drag and drop your PDF documents into the Mendeley application 
And what it would then do is we would try to extract um, information from the PDF document and build up a personal library of research papers. And the idea behind that is if you look at, uh, if you look at the industry, if you look at the, how the system works, we as researchers, when we write a manuscript or when we write a paper, we take so much time to get the formatting right, you know, the title, year of publication, the references. Right? It's, it's so much work, and then for every different journal you want to submit a paper to, you have, uh, have to have a different citation style. So we, we put so much effort into creating this manuscript, then we send it to the publisher, the publisher puts it in a PDF, and all that information is lost, because the PDF uh, is actually nothing else than a picture to a computer. Right? The, the computer will not understand what is the title. They will not, the computer will not understand this is the list of references. And it's ridiculous, right? You put so much effort into it and then it, the publisher puts it in the PDF and, and the information is lost. So the piece of R&D, the most important piece of R&D, if you like, that we did back then was we developed algorithms from a computer science perspective that would try to identify what is the title in a PDF document, what is the list of references. And the way that works is, for example, you look at, let's say, the first page, try to identify the first four-digit number that starts with one nine or two zero, and that's most likely the year of publication. So you try to kind of develop some clever algorithms. It's not rocket science. It's just like, you know, logic and then run algorithms and try to extract that information so that you can pre-populate your library of PDF documents automatically and then what you then have as a result is this list of, uh, let's say, you know, references uh, within your software and that helps you to, to organize your PDF documents. Um, what you then can do is within the application, uh, and I'll show you a little bit bigger screenshot afterwards, you have a PDF viewer inside the application as well, so you can read the PDF and you can make uh, highlights and annotations. So you can, you know, instead of printing out, then you have only one copy, you know, you make an annotation on the printout. Here you have it all digital, and whether you're at home or on mobile or in the office, you always have this information with you. So this was kind of the starting point, trying to develop this productivity software. And we started out because we were ourselves not programmers, so we were not only bad researchers, we also did not have any skill in actually developing software. Um, so what we did is we contracted Russian developers, uh, Bela Russian developers actually, an outsourcing company. We spent some of our money, I would say maybe 40,000 euros with the three of us. We gave that money to the Russian developers and they developed that prototype. Um, by the way, the algorithms to extract information from PDF documents, I, I was able to give that work to master students at the University of Cologne in Germany. Um, and have them do the work. So basically in the start of this idea, what I want to say is you try to kind of grab the resources where they are. There's not a lot of money involved. You need to, it's called bootstrap. Right? Use the little bits and pieces that you can find to put something together that makes sense so then you can try to raise more money. Anyway, we were focusing on that, on that individual productivity. But what we then uh, uh, realized quickly afterwards is research is inherently social, right? You work in a lab, you work with colleagues not only in one place, across the world. You know, you have an author, be, like one of your co-authors being located in a different lab. IIT spans across the whole country. So you cannot just focus on one person, but you also need to think about how do you enable collaboration for more people. So that was then the second step. We build in groups, you can drag and drop papers in these groups, you can share those groups. The annotations, which you saw were yellow, become, get different colors based on, based on the co-worker you work with. So you can really work with colleagues and stuff. And then the third step, and I think that was kind of a little bit of the conceptual kicker, which we didn't have in mind initially, but which we discovered along the way. Okay, imagine we have millions of researchers having installed Mendeley and they do their own data management and annotations and highlights. So it's basically an incredibly intelligent database where one scientist puts their information in one, in one Mendeley installation. Then those guys work with each other. How cool would it be if we could aggregate all that information and show it to the world and say, this is going on in research. Obviously we need to anonymize that, because researchers don't necessarily want to share work in progress, so you need to keep some privacy controls. But the idea was that we say, okay, let's look at Italy. Let's look at what 
the Italian computer scientists are publishing, what they're working on, what is the hottest topic in biochemistry. And we can do that by basically looking in real time into those databases and then see what's going on. And that was, I think, the biggest kicker and, and drives a huge uh, engine that enables additional services um, on top of that, such as recommendations, because you can say, here you have a library of, of papers for one researcher, and let's look at similar libraries, and maybe you can connect those two people, right? If you have double opt-in, both want to talk, well, you, you can enable collaboration. This is a screenshot of the software, just again, it's, it's, it's very, very product-driven. You need to find this one idea that you like, and it needs to be a product. Um, and here you can see, again, you have a search, and then, well, you know, as you type highlight stuff, you can create collections and, and tags and whatnot. So it's, it's, a, it's, again, a productivity software, and then here you have a screenshot, again, of the PDF viewer, the highlights annotations, then again, you have those highlights annotations as well on your iPad, on, on your iPhone, and so forth. This is a screenshot that shows you what happens when you aggregate information around one topic. And which is basically which became our mission that we said, okay, actually, okay, we do this productivity stuff, which is great, and we help support collaboration. But what we actually want to do is we want to now increase openness and, and transparency and collaboration for the scientific world as a whole. And that is what you need when you want to go to investors. You need to have an idea, a vision that demonstrates, you know, that you want to do something that goes beyond just a small feature. And here you can see, if you look into Mendeley's database and were to look at, for example, the topic biological sciences, we could then tell you what are the most popular groups that have the tag biological sciences. And then you could go into those groups, discover, discover other people, discover papers that those people find interesting. You find, you see the most popular papers, so uh, what is the most read paper for that specific uh, discipline? You see what are active members, what are popular tags. So this aggregation of information now suddenly drives a, a huge social discovery engine that goes beyond just you know going into a scientific database and search for an article. So, and that really took off. We now have 2.6 million members people who sign up to the service, and the really cool thing is the largest user bases are, are really the top universities in the world. So we realize, actually, our problem is, you know, my little problem as Jan Weichel, computer science PhD at the University of Cologne, is actually the same problem that a computer science professor at Cambridge or the top guys in Harvard have. They all have the same problem. Um, and because we did this, this you know, this, we solved this problem so well, we got so much love from users who said, well, I, I love what you do, how can I tell my friends about it? What we did is we built an advisor program where around the globe we kind of recruited Mendeley advisors who would represent <coughs> Mendeley on campus. And the, the reason why they do this is not because we develop reference management software, right? That's not the reason. So that's the what do we do, right? We do reference management software and maybe we do it a little bit better than other companies. But if you want to get investors, if you want to get people like the Mendeley advisors, you need to keep in mind why do you do this, which comes back to the vision, right? Why do we do this? Because we want to increase openness and collaboration in science. And once you have that strong answer to a why, you know, which is the core of why you actually exist, as a product, then you start. You have people affiliate themselves with you, and they want to represent you. Anyway, that was a nice success story as well. And, and again, currently we have uh, 2,000 advisors around the globe who, who do workshops, education, tell the librarian, uh, spread the word. So that's really, really powerful because if you're being recommended a tool like Mendeley from one of your colleagues, it's obviously you know word of mouth is very strong. On top of that. If you look at how people organize uh, data and documents with the Mendeley, who would have thought how many documents, how many research papers there are in this world? Nobody knows. Right? We currently track information on 470 million research papers. So this is like for the first time we are able to see the dimension of, of scientific research, of what's going on in this world. 
So we know information about 470 million research papers. And what kind of information do we know about this? So, of course, we know, you know, what is the document about, just journaling, right? But then we know who is reading it. So what is the profile? Is this a computer scientist reading a consumer research paper, for example, which would be interesting to know. Um, we know what kind of tags and information those people add to those documents. Um, that lets us power recommendation engine, social recommendations based on people interacting with content. And we have real-time reading and information and usage stats on, on which papers are being read. So for example, you have a paper or a, an article that is published in a, in a, in a very high-quality journal, but actually it doesn't have so many readers, right? So then you get into the discussion of how does the impact factor relate to actual consumption and engagement with usage. So it's an interesting, let's say, complementary world that we are now opening and exploring because uh, we all know that the impact factor, even though it's being used usually in science, is kind of a very bad me metric to measure the value of an individual article. <coughs> So, as I said, all this information around 400, 500 million documents is possibly not something we could evaluate for our, ourselves. It's too much information. We're a small team, 50, 60 people, it's too much. So, what we said is, we believe in openness, again, it's our vision, openness, transparency, collaboration. So, we let other people access this information via an API, an application programming interface that where other people can look into our database, extract data, and play around, right? Our, our idea was give the data to the people and they will figure out something useful with it. We don't have to tell them what to do. Here's the data, do it. What then, what then happened is we had about 2,000 developers signing up. Out of that we had resulting, let's say, 300, about 300 third-party applications. And what those guys have built is, for example, uh, here you can see uh, uh, an Android app or um, an application that lets you sync your Mindplay library with uh, your Kindle device. Uh, another idea would, would have been um, uh, here you have, like, for example, a science card which demonstrates your impact as a scientist, and they use Mendeley information as well to complement their stuff. So, some really, really good stuff. Um, it's still a very early stage, but the philosophy of you know, this economy of sharing and openness and letting people reuse, again, I think was pretty unusual to the academic publishing industry where you have huge paywalls, expensive access to content, uh, and so we kind of demonstrated that there is another way of creating value. And by the way, this is not the papers themselves, it's only about the information about the papers. So imagine if we gave more access to even the papers to the broader world, uh, how much of an impact that could have. And that resulted in tremendous, again, user love. People who just tweeted about us and sent us emails. And there are some, some really good things in here. Uh, so, for example, this year, tweet, Mendeley is the bomb for academic gangsters looking to blow it up or raw like here. Or, I love Mendeley, right? It brings back the fun to science. So Mendeley, greatest life cycle ever. So, again, we did this reference management software, and you would not expect people to say, I love you, right, for developing reference management software. So, and eventually it led to uh, even guys like the CTO of Amazon, who was a former scientist, to say, I strongly believe that Mendeley can change the face of science. So what is my conclusion from this kind of, you know, product, product and growth? I think whatever you do, and if you want it to be successful, you really need to like it. Do something you really like. So let's say, I have to admit, I didn't really like that much doing research, it was a good time, but it was not my passion to do research. So I had this side project, which I suddenly kind of felt more and more passionate about, and I started to like it, and suddenly it took over my life. But if you do something that you really, really like, then it's more likely uh, that first it will become successful, and even if it doesn't become successful, you can still spend a lot of time with it, because you don't need it to become successful, because you already like it. Secondly, if you want to, from a business perspective, have impact, um, I think you need to have a great product. You, you, if you don't have the right product, you can't win by just having PR, right? You can't win by just having the lowest price. You need to have a good product. Um, and obviously, as I said earlier, great vision doesn't hurt. So, if you, you, you need, like, if you look at your thing, what you're doing right now, try to step two steps back and try to find 
from a high level perspective, someone who is not familiar with what you're doing, how to explain what you want. And if I go out and say Mendeley stands for increasing openness and collaboration in science, that is very powerful compared to saying, well, we do reference management better than EndNote. And then think about how you spread the word. What is marketing, right? And marketing is not running marketing campaigns and having television advertising. No, it's evangelizing on the floor. What I do here now is marketing because I, I believe what I do is the right thing. And I'm more than happy to come and visit Fulvio and say, you know, I'm going to talk to you about this because this is what I feel passionate about. But you need to, you need to talk about this. You need to talk with, about this with the individuals, with every individual, and every individual. The PR, once you do that, something like that, the PR will follow. Journalists will become, uh, will get attention. The technology transfer office will get attention and then they will put you in touch with the communi uh, communications people and so forth. So, from a product perspective, these are my kind of three learnings that, uh, that I want to um, give you on the way. So, let me talk you through the, the group of founders, how we raised money and how this kind of suddenly exit which we, by the way, never really thought about, came together. The three founders are German. Um, I'm German, ho studiato nella Italia, uh, a Roma, però il mio italiano non è più così che posso fare questa presentazione in italiano, so I will switch back to English. But anyway, we, we, we were three Germans, but we decided actually, even though you all know that Germany is doing pretty well these days, uh, we actually decided to move to England. And that had a couple of reasons. So why did we sail over? And it's, it's largely due to three, three areas. So we needed access to our core market. So once we decided this should become something more important, we needed to access to the market and academia is English speaking, right? It's all the English guys either in the UK or in the US. So how can we get close to these people? And we didn't have any relationships to the US. So London, you know, within the European Union, we could just go over and start work. It's, it's not a barrier. We at that time thought about potentially moving to Berlin, but uh, then again, I was lucky I had the business background, so I could evaluate a little bit kind of the investment environment and uh, employment law in, in Germany, and it's less, uh, it's less restrictive even in the UK. So if you want to hire people, uh, it's much easier to hire people and also, frankly, to fire people in, in the UK than in Germany. Um, the second piece is access to resources. So if you want to build this business, you need people, right? A product and a business only works with people. That is something that I've learned in a very, very painful way. Uh, you only can win through people. That's the only way. You can have a product that's as great as it like. If you don't have the right people to continue to work on that, it doesn't work. You need to have the right people. Um, and it's easy to hire to London. Our team in London of 50, 60 people consists of, I think, like, I don't know, 15 different nationalities, so that's great. And then secondly, what's the investment environment? And Salvatore and I we were speaking before, you know, about what's the investment climate in Italy, and that is something you have to consider, right? Where do you get the money? Um, and then lastly, access to network. So don't underestimate having access to people who have built businesses, who you can talk to, who you can give you advice. So you need to get everything, everything you can, everything you can, every little piece of information, every little money, piece of money, everything you can to, to make it successful. So when you build your business, and again, for your, for your ideas that you might have, maybe London is not the best place, right? If you look at engineering, for example, it might be the right thing here. Um, if you may look at computer science, it might be the US, but these are things that you have to keep in mind. Yeah, so this is once upon a time, and uh, this is the funding story, how we raised money and, and, and how did we advance uh, the business. So this was 2007. So these are the three founders, Victor, Paul and me. And this guy was our lead investor, Stefan Glenzer. We knew him back from university. Uh, he was a guest lecturer in an um, in entrepreneurship class which we had at university. And he had built a couple of companies before, quite successfully actually. He's probably the most successful German entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, and business angel. So what you need to do is you need to identify, let's say, one, two, three really important people that can help you to build your business, and there it's important to aim high, right? It's, it's, it's always easier to cascade down than to try and climb up. 
So try to aim high for the people you work with. Again, it's about the people. How, how do we work? Um, how do you get to success through people? So this was 2007. This guy, in a handshake deal, well, luckily because we know him from university, gave us you know, some initial money, maybe around 150, 200,000 euros, to continue the development with the Russian guys. Um, whilst we were raising, <laughs> whilst we were, hey, no, <laughs> whilst we were raising a, a bigger funding round through his network. So he knew quite a couple of uh, uh, professional VCs and eventually we pulled together a funding round with uh, those kind of three uh, partners. So one were the engineers who built Skype, Skype founding uh, engineers, and they set up an investment vehicle, Indian Sound Investment. Um, then we had one guy from Warner Music uh, who acted as a business angel as well, and he was uh, head of digital strategy at Warner Music before, and the last of them, he was the guy who, who built last of with those, uh, with those guys, we then raised uh, roughly 1.5 million euros. Um, at that point, that was 2008. Just, just a quick check. How much do you think we raised in total? How much money do you think we needed to get to where we are right now? Like in, I mean, you know that this was 1.5 million euros. So what do you think is the total amount you would need for something like that? Any just guess? 1.5? Okay. Uh, more guess? 2 million? So in total we raised 10. 10 million. Just to give you, show you, I mean you don't raise 10 in the first step, right? You, it's, it's step by step. But just to give you an impression of how capital intensive just software is. I, I, I don't have enough experience and background in engineering where it's about real products, uh, not just software. Um, but I imagine it will potentially be more, but just to give you an impression uh, uh, how, how, how big this can become. What spell of time do you raise them? Within probably five to, yeah, five years. So it was three rounds of time? Yes, it was a seed round, and then you call the first big one, 1.5, you call it Series A, and then the next one was Series B. Okay, so back to um, the, the, the exit. So, again, why did suddenly Elsevier and many other publishers actually in that market feel that this is important what we're doing? So if you look at the academic content in the world, right, all the research papers, uh, conference proceedings, and whatever is out there, there's a massive amount of content that is being published by the publishers. And on top of that, you then have, let's say, a smaller sliver of metadata, so stuff like semantic, uh, semantic interlinking. So you have service providers in that market that try to extract entities from research papers and connect them and kind of do some automated data mining. But then there's one thing that is in this industry that's always going on, it's like what we're doing now, but nobody is really capturing, which is the social layer, right? How do people interact with content? How do people interact with other people? Uh, how do they consume the content and all that stuff, right? How do they collaborate? So this is kind of where we started out and where we have very unique value proposition. But now, what happens if tomorrow, suddenly, this social layer is the driving and the dominant force of how people interact with academic content and how people discover academic content? What happens and if we then don't have the infrastructure to capture that? But we lose out on a big opportunity. And the funny thing is you can see in other more typical consumer industries like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, these are all let's say, aggregation services. And all the pure content providers, the pure publishers, be it news, music, record labels, academic publishers, whoever it is, right, they all struggle. No one understands this because their business is a different business. And they have their cake eaten by the new kids on the block. And so we need to think about how do we build that infrastructure to, um, to capture this uh, uh, social layer because it will become more important. And with this idea, uh, once it started out from just pure reference management, you know, we grew it step by step by talking to people, engaging with people, developing the idea. On the way, we kind of probably won 
um, every ward for startups that's out there, which is great because it encourages you to, 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 uh, to continue. This is the nice side. The bad side of, of the story is you saw the funding story before, right? Series A, Series B. We probably spoke, spoke to every of the top 100 VCs in this world. The only two or three guys you could convince were those guys I showed you before. Every other VC in this world said, no, I don't believe this. Well, how many scientists can there be? You don't have a revenue model. We got, I mean, 97% rejection. But if you believe in something, you have to be persistent, right? You just have to find the three guys who support you. And then with that money, demonstrate that you have an impact. So there's a nice story, great right? awards, but an award doesn't give you money, right? So and you need to pay you need to pay the payroll the next month. So it's a very it's it's very tough. But eventually we were kind of successful because of the idea of you know let's capture that social data. We had tremendous user love, tremendous user attraction, and then eventually um, we got acquired by uh, by Elsevier uh, on my 34th birthday, 9th of April this year. So I had a very very nice birthday present. <laughs> How did that happen? So, the idea behind that is similar to the investors, similar to the users. It's about relationships, right? It's about how do you build lasting relationships with your customers, with your investors, with your co-founders, with your employees. Because, and I will show you a statistic just now, the time it takes to build a company is impressively long. So it's about building these relationships. Which means also building those relationships with those guys who you might potentially threaten because they have an established business model, they have an established stake in the market. And you need to threaten them, but you also need to be close because actually what we wanted to do is we wanted to help, right? We wanted to help an LCB of that world, we wanted to help them. And if you guys don't want to be helped, then we still can't care, right? We still have to move on, but we want to help them. So we had discussions since the beginning of, of, of Mendeley. We always continued to talk to them. And eventually, it helped us to understand how Elsevier thinks. Who is behind Elsevier? Who are the decision-making people? What do they want? What are their problems? And we built this relationship with a new guy who started at Elsevier, who had a very strong product view, who came from eBay uh, and who joined Elsevier. So he had a strong uh, background in uh, software technologies, search, um, and this kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, we started to talk to them and they said, well, you know, what you're doing is great. Uh, could we build something together? And we said, yes, we could. And, and, um, and then eventually they said, well, it's difficult to build something really meaningful together if they, this has to be governed by bilateral contracts, right? If you have to build something that is, uh, might become a core feature of the product and that is governed by the bilateral contract you still might have incentivization problems. So in the end, uh, they said, well, have you thought about maybe getting acquired um, by us? And the response was obviously no, never. Uh, well, in fact, at some point, obviously, we thought about that, right? They might, they might come along uh, and, and acquire us, but it, it was not, we didn't build this because, well, we wanted to become millionaires. I mean, we started, I mean, we started this because we were frustrated with the situation we were passionate about what we were doing, and fine, I would, you know, I would have continued to do that. Um, but it's about building these relationships with the, the, the counterparties. Mm. I will skip that slide and just move on. So let me just quickly ask you, I was, I was saying relationships, why long-lasting relationships? Just a question, how long do you think it takes, usually, for a startup company, admittedly in the software field, to become successful, to become successful, and by successful I mean, let's say, a, a startup company hitting 50 million dollars in revenues per year. So, how many years do you think it takes a company to get to that point? Any idea? Throw some numbers at me. Five. Five years? Five to ten? Okay, yes. Yeah, it's, it's probably more around the ten. So, it's on average, it takes a company. Nine years, nine years to reach to reach 50 million in revenues. So what you can see here is this is the, uh, the top 100 software companies publicly quoted 
on NASDAQ, and it shows you how long, on average, does it take a company to reach the 50 million threshold. So you have, obviously you have kind of the rocket ships, which are, let's say, Twitter, Facebook, uh, right, you know, the exception to the rule, and then you have a huge amount of companies who are publicly traded, but it took them, you know, more than 20 years to get to 50 million revenues. And when you write your business plan that you present to investors, what you do is you come up with numbers that demonstrate that you can reach 50 million in revenues in year three. Right? It's selling a story, it's selling the vision. But the reality is, if you choose to do your business, you will be in this for 10 years. So Mendeley was luckily, or not luckily, I mean, we didn't really actually care because we chose this as a lifestyle, but we were probably one of those rocket ships in terms of exit value. We didn't reach that, term, that, that 50 million valuation in terms of revenues, but in terms of exit value. So when you choose to do this, I think you have to be aware of the fact that this would be a lifestyle choice as much as I think it is a lifestyle choice to be a scientist and a researcher. So you have to realize that you're in this for the long term, which means you cannot run a long-term business on short-term relationships, either with investors, customers, other stakeholders, whoever it is. So the conclusion from all of that is, I think we were a very complementary and very strong founding team. Uh, we trusted each other. We knew we were going to do this for the long term, um, and, and we knew even if we had conflict, we would resolve that conflict. Um, in terms of investors, you know, you need to find investors. I, I think investors, besides the fact that they add money, they should add additional value. So you can engage them and say, you know, how should we do X, Y, Z? Should we, should we start to monetize or should we continue to grow? Um, should we raise more money or should we have a lower burn rate? I mean, try to find those guys who can help you with some advice. But very important, don't take their advice for the ultimate truth. So we did the mistake that we listened too much to our investors. So uh, there was a time when, for example, we decided to uh, open an office in the US. And uh, I, I moved over to New York, I spent two years in New York, which was a medium of good experience. I mean, personally, it was an exciting experience, but it was certainly sad to see that the company was suffering because one of the founders was not in the office, and so we were losing drive in London. Even and eventually, after two years, I decided to, to come back. Um, so, engage your investors, seek for advice, but don't take that advice for the only truth. Right? They, the investors have their view of the world, but you eventually are responsible for making this happen. And then, lastly, uh, build relationships that last. So the funny thing is now, we've exited, but everything we did, there was nothing about aiming for an exit. We never did this because we wanted to have a 50 million exit, because we wanted to get rich, or uh, because, uh, I don't know, whatever reason. No, we did this because it was fun. It was our decision to go this way and, and, and to have that lifestyle, because we were enjoying what we were doing. And that, I believe, will lead to ultimate success. Mistakes and learnings. Um, it's one of the last slides, uh, but I want to quickly talk you through some of the big mistakes we made on the way. So as I said, you can only be successful with the right people. And the, one of the biggest mistakes we made in the beginning is we hired too many, too junior people. So if you, if you see now, we completely underestimated how big this thing can get. And if you want to build a platform for a couple of million people and hundreds of millions of documents, right, you, you can't have a bachelor graduate in computer science build that platform, it's impossible, it doesn't work. And, and so we hired two junior. In the beginning we said, okay, let's save a little bit of money and you know, not, not spend too much on salaries, but rather than hiring, let's say, three junior guys, we should have just hired one really good guy. That, 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 was, that was one of the biggest mistakes. And Mendeley, up to this day, is suffering from that mistake that we made in the past. Because like, the, the platform, I mean, maybe it looks nice, but if you can look, if you look behind the scenes, I mean, uh, we're cranking away. I mean, it's, uh, it's still difficult. We listen too much to our investors, as I said earlier. Uh, the example with the US, right? It's good to listen, but you should not automatically implement all that advice. One of the things we luckily avoided, so was one of our investors always said, well, let's build a Facebook app. All the students are on Facebook. Let's build a Facebook app. And we were like, God, how could a Facebook app look like? I mean, we really could not make up an idea of how a Mendeley Facebook app could look like. And, 
And so it didn't feel right. I mean, it was hard to find, let's say, clear evidence, but you know, we were running this thing and we couldn't make it. We, we, we couldn't find a way to do it. Luckily, we didn't because I feel like it, it is the wrong way. Like, it's, it's a different world. We want to focus on the researchers, not on, not on the students. So we, we didn't do that, at least. And we tried to do too much. So when you do this, uh, another very important thing is you need to be very focused on one thing. And we had a big challenge in the sense of we tried to do too much, right? Build that, build that feature, run the advisor program, open an office in the US, hire people. It's like, you, the world is full of opportunities. Once you start this, there are too many opportunities. So the problem is not finding opportunities. Once you went through the door number one, you will see there are ten doors. You just need to go through door number one and you will see ten more doors. And then that's the challenge. The challenge is not going through the door number one. The challenge is then looking at which of the next ten doors are you doing. And we try to open five doors at once. Uh, again, we, we, I think, suffer still today because we built too much on the platform and we should have been more focused. Some learnings. The difficult part is not building the business. The difficult part is not monetization. The difficult part is not uh, talking to investors, creating a presentation. The difficult part is not working a lot. The difficult part is managing your emotions when you fail. When yet another VC says no. When uh, your users say your product is crap. They did so in Mendeley's case for one year. We just took bad feedback, but we used that feedback to improve the product, so eventually we got to product market fit. Um, the difficult time is when you fight with your co-founders. So these are the difficult things. The difficult thing is the emotion. It's, it's just that. So what is important is that if that is a difficult part, you need to find people who you can enjoy the ride with. And if you take it as a lifestyle decision, then you need to have very, very good and strong co-founders or a very good girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, family. So people who you can share with. Because what I experienced is if you have sorrows and you share those sorrows and problems with whoever who understands you, then those sorrows will just be half the pain. Whilst the good stuff, if you can share good stuff and success, will just like be double the, but double the fun. So find people to enjoy the ride with. And lastly is, you know, this is a lifestyle decision. It's 10 years, long-term relationships. It's a lifestyle decision with all ups and downs. And there are likely more downs than ups. Right? So this is my talk. Um, I hope uh, this was good and interesting for you. I'm here for more questions. So I'm obviously interested in how I can help you and what might be your questions. Thank you. Let me thank you for the uh, amazing speech and the simplicity that came out of your uh, experience, uh, the way you lived it. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions, uh, and uh, let me once again uh, uh, thank also Fulvio for making this uh, happening today. Uh, any questions from the audience? Hi. Um, well, I was interested to know about your relation with QT. I mean, I think your uh, graphical user interface is based on that pl platform. Uh, is, is that, that correct? QT. You know, yeah. Your graphical unit, unit interface is based on that platform. So I wanted to understand how is your relation with that company and how do you manage the commercialization of the, of the product? So, so just for background, for those of you who might not know um, the details about that, uh, the software works on different platforms, right? It works on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And in order for us not to develop a user interface for all of these platforms, yet again from scratch, we use a framework, we use a, a library, which is called Qt, which uh, basically standardizes the appearance of the interface across all of these three platforms. Um, and that is good and bad at the same time. It's good because it saves us time, right? Because we can just use one standard library and one standard product to work on all three platforms. But it's also bad in the sense of that, for example, it doesn't really get to the 100% native feeling. So if you work on Mac 
and specifically Mac users are very particular about that. You know, if, if the button is not exactly the way the Apple design thinks it should be, then those guys will show up and say, this is not right. So, and, and, and you need to then make a decision about, okay, do you want to develop native for Mac and lose the advantage of, of QG? So, so, again, in the end, when we started this, we did not have so many resources, so we said, what's the easiest way to at least get started? And that was the reason why we decided for QT. As far as I understand, um, you can, uh, I, I'm not, I did the licensing myself back then, and I think you, you pay a, a standard flat fee, and then you're free to do whatever you like, even if you want to commercialize your product. So it's, it's relatively simple. You decide you want to use it or not, and you then use it. You apply for that license, I think it's a small fee, and then you can do, even if you want to monetize your product later on, you can still do that, uh, and you don't need to pay more. So it's quite, a, it's quite a convenient solution, even though, again, we still occasionally get, you know, some negative feedback from the core Apple users, but then fine, right? Let me ask you one question. Um, when did you uh, start making money out of Mendeley, and uh, how many times uh, uh, did you adjust your business model? Uh, that's a, it's also a very good question. I, I think I'm, I have a split heart about that. On the one hand, I wish I would have started to decide to monetize earlier, because as an entrepreneur, it gives you more freedom, right? It gives you more power com uh, compared to uh, in, in front of the investors. At the same time, monetization is very tricky, and that's yet another thing we would have needed to worry about. So, what we actually did is, within the, the, the group of, of, of directors, board of directors, which means founders, investors, we decided uh, not to monetize. We said, okay, we focus just on growth, so we do it the US style, right? Twitter, just go out, try to get millions of users, we'll figure out how you make money afterwards. Which is one way of doing it, right? Which works very well in the US because that's the mentality that the US investors have. I would be very careful in Europe. I think not many European investors have that mentality. So that is a very important discussion that you need to have. We, again, decided not to monetize very early on, keep the team free of worrying about that, focus on building the product, getting traction, and then we started to monetize uh, probably in year, well, towards the end of year four, starting of year five. So we had quite a lot of time to actually, you know, and, th and that was good because retrospectively now I, I think this monetization piece is, is a beast, right? It's, it's so difficult to solve this in the sense of you need to have a product person, you need to think about the pricing, you need to have cohort analysis, customer acquisition costs, customer lifetime, I mean, it's like a whole new world that suddenly opens and that you need to worry about. Um, the business model that we decided for initially was a freemium model. So, <laughs> freemium being you have a standard version for free, everybody can go and use Mendeley up to a certain level, and then depending on how much you want to get out of the product, you pay five, ten, fifteen dollars. There's one interesting anecdote which I uh, would like to tell you. Initially, we started out with just two premium packs, which was five and ten dollars. And so then we said, okay, let's play around with those prices, right? Because we can, we have the freedom. So let's try to understand what our uh, users would do. And those were, I think, had specific names, student and professional or something like that. So we said, okay, let's just play around and introduce a third package to also capture the students. We thought about, let's price this at, I don't know, $3 or $2.50, right? To capture, like, really, those guys who don't have that much money. And then we said, stop, hold on a second. What we can always do is we can always decrease prices in the future. We can never increase prices because once you set the standard and once you set the default, and there are some very interesting TED talks about the strength of defaults. Right? Look at uh, Apple. They only have two versions of the iPhone, black and white. I mean, now they put out a new one, but it's just black and white. Right? You can't choose a lot. So we said, what is the what is the standard? What is the default? So we said, okay, before we go down, let's try to introduce. Uh, package price of $15, which we call unlimited. Just to see. And before the split up of paying users between $5 and $10 was 90% would go for $5 and 10% of the users who pay would go for the $10 package. Kind of logic, right? If we went after we introduced, we didn't change anything else. We did not improve more features, uh, not introduce more features, nothing. We just introduced the $15 package calling unlimited with unlimited features. 
uh, limited storage and whatnot, but people would not even hit their limits with a $5 package. What we saw is that the split up of users was then shifting from 1910 to 60, 20, 20. It's amazing. So just by having a third option, people, like we would increase our uh, uh, average uh, revenue per user significantly just by this thing. It's, it's so amazing. And why would that be? Because people don't want to stay in the lowest package. They go for the middle, right? If you have three things as a choice and you don't know what to choose, well, probably the middle one, <laughs> right? Makes sense. And then we labeled the first one student. Professional unlimited. I want unlimited. I don't need unlimited, but I don't know that I don't need unlimited. I want unlimited. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? So that's the anecdotal anecdote about about pricing. So it's 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 very rarely the way you think it is. And the nice thing about all this kind of web and software stuff is it gives you a way to play around and explore and learn. And this is what is this entrepreneurial life science thing. Every day you learn. Right, every day you need to handle these situations. So we started with that one, and then afterwards we actually discovered there's an institutional model. So once we captured all the uh, users in these institutions, they would talk to their librarians and say, well, I'm using this Mendeley thing, can't we do workshops? Uh, and, and what's your support? Uh, can the institution pay for my premium? And so what then happened is the institutions reached out to us and was like, Oops. well, University College London suddenly wants to have a presentation about Mendeley. What's that, right? And so we discovered there is a new revenue model, which is a B2B revenue model, where we now offer an institutional version. And so, you know, you, I would say in the, in the software world, the approach of not worrying about monetization in the first instance is not too bad. Because you will find, if you have a product that creates value, you will find a, a way to make money.